once Chris told me we want to start in about 10 days, I said, well, have you guys got any demos? And he said, we have a rehearsal tape we can send. Oh and a couple days later, a cassette showed up in the mail. I was like, holy cow, that's fast. I guess maybe they were some sort of version of FedEx at the time. <laughs> I don't know. And I, and I put in to listen to it, and it was Kurt talking. And he goes, hey, it's Kurt, man. We got a new drummer, Dave Grohl. He's the best drummer in the world. We're going to play some new songs for you. And I hear Dave going, hi, Butch, like this. And it click, click, click. And they went into Teen Spirit. Yep. And I could hear the riff, and as soon as the drums came in, the guitars, it just distorted like crazy. Because it had they were recording with the built-in condenser microphones sure. that you have on a boombox, so it just sounded like shit. But I could hear the song. Yeah. And you know, I could hear the hello, hello, and I, I knew the song sounded great. Come as you are was on there. Um, you don't still have the tape, do you, Butch? I do have the tape somewhere. I think it's out. You can. That's also probably it's on the internet somewhere. I think you can find. But I mean, that. I'm. I mean, the physical. I do. Tape. I do have the physical tape. Okay. Yeah, I've got some boxes of archival stuff at home. So I got a chance to hear the songs, even though they sounded horrible on the cassette. And uh, before we went into Sound City, I booked three days of in a rehearsal room in North Hollywood. Were they staying at the Oakwood Apartments out there? The Oakwood Apartments. Yes, they were. <laughs> They were staying right across the pool from Europe. Now the band Europe had had that big, the final countdown. It was yes. a massive hit, right? Oh, yeah. They yeah. were all really good looking guys, really skinny, <laughs> long blonde hair, beautiful girlfriends, living large. Little did they know that Nevermind was gonna come out and drive the nail into that type of metal that was getting airplay at the time. Yeah, we scheduled three days of rehearsal. I didn't wanna do any more than that because I knew from working with Kurt at SMART, on the, what we called the SMART sessions the year before, that he was really impatient. And, and I didn't know this until I went in there, but they'd been practicing pretty much every day for six months. Okay. So when we got into uh, the rehearsal studio, I noticed Kurt had a big Mesa boogie. Chris had his SVT. They had a couple of different vocal mics set up. Dave's kit was in the middle of the room. There were no mics on it. And normally I'd go in and I'd put a mic on the kick around the snare and you put a little bit into the PA just to get it you know, so you can hear it in the room. They were like, hey Butch, what do you want us to play? I go, just play whatever you want. I'm just gonna listen and take notes and just run through everything. And they kicked into Teen Spirit and it just floored me how powerful it was. So I, I remember getting up and pacing around the room going, oh my God, oh my God, listening to it. Watching Dave Drum and just listening to how incredibly powerful it sounded. They finished the song and it sort of stopped. It was just dead silent. Kurt said, what do you think? I said, play it again, play it again. <laughs> and the second time, I took some notes, just some, some minuscule things. We did a little bit of tightening up on the arrangement, but not much. They ran through everything that day, and uh, I was like, God, they, they are pretty tight. They, they have really rehearsed. They kind of know what they're doing. There were a few songs where Kurt was still trying to figure out the exact melody and a couple spots he hadn't finished lyrics to, but Chris and Dave had most of their parts all worked out, and Dave, uh, to this day, man, he writes hooks on drums. Yes. You know, he, he doesn't do every time a course because I'll play a do, new fill, I'll play something different. He comes up with a part and that becomes a hook. You listen yeah. and never mind, the drums are hooks. There's hooks all over the place. Yeah. The band's rehearsed, you take notes, you know what songs you're going to record. Are all the songs that made it on the record, are they finished at that time? All the songs that we knew we were going to track, except one, Polly, which had been recorded at Smart. Um, they ran through plus two other songs that were not finished at all. A song, one was called Song in D, which I liked a lot because it reminded me of R.E.M. There's a jangly riff in D, okay. but Kurt had no lyrics for it. And uh, I think that might have come out later. I think they also ran through a song called Old Age, which was not finished. Again, that maybe came out in some sort of form later. But we basically just recorded those 11 songs that's, okay. that, that we finished. And uh, most of them went really quickly. I'm trying to remember which song we tracked first. Some people say it was Teen Spirit, but I don't think so because usually when I knew a song was a possible key song in an album, I yeah, would usually do, wait do like later. three or four. Yeah. Let's do something that's an album track just to figure out how the studio sounds and get the tones and whatever. And then, so I probably, in my memory probably did Teen Spirit like third or fourth or something. I could probably find out, I bet if I asked Geffen for the, if I could see the multi-track tape boxes, a photo of them, I would know what order, because i would write in bloom, Teen Spirit, you know, he'd write on yeah. the back that the songs you tracked. So you recorded on, do you remember the, the tape machine you recorded on? It was a Studer, I believe, an 800. Mm -hmm. 
possibly an A80, but I think it was an A800, one of the newer Studers. So you're in a new studio, you're recording through a Neve console. Had you recorded through a Neve before at that time or no? I had. We'd been on Neves with some of the records I'd done with Spooner okay. in studios in Chicago. Yep. And I remember Gary Cleave, who did our first record, he was like, Neve is the holy grail. Right. That's what you want to record on. I'm like, why? He goes, because they sound amazing. But we couldn't never afford a Neve if it's smart. We were always looking for the cheap console. So the, to, to be able to record on that console in particular, because it was modified, customized in a way that just sounded so good. And Dave Grohl owns that, by the way, now. That, uh, that yeah. Yeah, he, he, when Sound City closed down, he uh, he went in there. I think a lot of people bid more money on it, but they wanted the people in the studio wanted Dave to have it, so it's sort of stayed in family. So when you started tracking that, what was the setup in tracking? Where where was Dave? Did the guys have their amps and isolation booths, and Ke and Kurt would track his vocals as a scratch? How would you guys do it? Did they play with clicks with any of the songs or not? We set Dave's drums up in the center of the room, and. I put Chris's SVT in a closet to the side, and then Kurt had a couple amps. He brought his Mesa Boogie, and then I also rented a Fender Bassman, because okay. you know I'm fond of those, and a Vox AC30. So we had those if we wanted cleaner sounds for strummy guitars. Set Dave up pretty much how I would have it smart, mm -hmm. probably a D12 or a RE20 on the kick. I think I used a couple mics on the top of the snare. At that point, I might have been doing the the 451 and 57 together. And, and you mix them together, yes, yeah. and you bust them together. I had a bottom snare mic. I know I had two 87s in the room. I can't remember if they were 414s or U67s on top. I think I probably used 414s for overheads, might have used U67s. There's probably a photo or two that you might be able to tell from that. I've, ne I've never seen any photos from that session, yeah. I don't think. I kick myself because I never took photos back then. I always felt like the studio was sort of a sanctuary. Yeah. And so I didn't like cameras coming in. Um, and well, now everybody records everything on their phone. What kind of Mesa Boogie did Kurt have? Do you remember? I don't remember. It was one of the newer ones. I, like a lot of the metal bands were using. Them. Yeah. It was so loud. Um, and we used that probably on about half the record, but a lot of the heavier stuff, like uh, the course in Lithium and In Bloom, I'm pretty sure that was the Bassman. All the clean guitars, the strummy stuff, that was, I'm sure, the Vox AC30. The, the, one of the key things we did with Dave's drums, we built a drum tunnel. So I took another bass drum shell and put it on his bass drum, the front of his bass drum, mm -hmm. And then you cover it with packing blankets, and then you can pull the second mic. I'm sure it was a FET 47. So there's a, a close mic by the, in, really close by the front head. And then I, the FET 47 was maybe five feet or six feet away. And by putting it inside the second drum, you, did the second drum have heads, and you act as a no, no, it's just a shell, just as a as a tunnel, just as a tunnel. And then yeah. we put the mic in there, and you cover it with packing blankets. So. It would get some of the extra thump coming from the kick, but then you didn't get all the bleed from the cymbals. And I, I knew I needed that because Dave hit the drums so hard. Right. <laughs> Just pounded them. It, it's funny, if you hear Teen Spirit, the take we got, the snare, whatever pitch it's at, it's down like two full steps at the end of the song. Uh -huh. like, and you wouldn't know it if you go, here's a snare, do, 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 and then you go back to the start, whoa, dude, it's, whoa, it's like two pitches up. He beat it so hard that it, the drum had to submit, you know. Most of the stuff was not done to a click, correct? The only song that was done to a click was Lithium. And, and funny, why, why was that? Well, there's a funny story why we did Lithium to a click. The day we tracked it, they started playing, you know, doo, 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 doo. as soon as they kicked in, it sped up. And not bad, you know, speeding up's okay in rock and roll. Yeah. But it was the only time I noticed it really kind of lurching. And Kurt noticed that too, and he said, what do we do? I, I just don't like the way this is feeling. And, and we did three or four takes, and we got to the end of the one of the takes, and they didn't even finish the end. Kurt just said, stop, stop, stop. He goes, I, I, this doesn't feel right to me. And then he launched into Endless Nameless. Okay. And I've never seen so much rage on a person's face. Like, it was scary. And you were still rolling the tape. We were rolling the tape. Yeah. And they launched into that song. At the end, Kurt completely smashed his guitar, blew his voice out. And I think he was, on that particular take, he was playing his left-handed Mose right. And he smashed it to bits. And uh, it ended up, the dust is settling, stopped the tape, I go, okay guys, um, I guess let's call it today. And uh, 
let's uh, pick up tomorrow. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> damn, I got to go find a left-handed Mos right. Like he had a couple of other backup guitars there, like a jazz master and a, maybe a Telecaster or whatever. But he, he liked that particular Mos right. I pulled Dave aside before they went out the door and said, have you ever played to a click? And he said, no, why? And he goes, I, I think maybe we should try it. You know, try it. It might be worth it on the song to keep a really steady groove. And I had, I always carry this tiny little rolling drum machine with me. And I think he had a, maybe a kick snare hat, or maybe they'd still set up in the rehearsal room. Anyway, he said, oh, I'll, go, I'll go try it tonight. And he came in the next day, and I said, how, how'd it go with a click? He said, I, you know, I, I think it's okay. I don't like playing too much, but I, I think it'll be okay. So we roll a click, lithium, first take, boom, done. Perfect. I mean, I didn't have to do any drum editing. I was just like, oh my God, Dave Grohl is a machine. He told me years later doing Wasting Light that when I asked him to play with a click track, I broke his heart. But only for one day. <laughs> <laughs> would Chris's bass parts be done at the same time or would you typically overdub those in the control room afterwards? Most of the songs when we tracked, I was going for drums and hopefully bass. And I would say probably seven of the 11 songs, Chris got the bass, except I might go back and go, you just missed the downbeat on the chorus, let's just punch that in. Or, you know, I'd, I'd listen to it, I'd mute the guitars and just listen on the take all the way through, let's just fix this. Or sometimes I get a little out of tune in the spot and Chris would go, what do you want me to do? I'd go, just play along. I, you don't even know where I'm punching in and out. So, and then he would come in the control room so he could hear it on the big speakers and we, we'd run the cable out to his amp. And he'd play along, but he always wanted like, uh, can you start me at the beginning of the song, even though it was like the last chorus or whatever. <laughs> it was just weird for him right. to pick up, like I don't want to come out the last bar of the solo, and he, ev he eventually figured that out. But, okay. So I just say, just play along, and I'd have some notes, i go in, out, and just let him play along, and then I'd go back in, just punch in the spots that needed fixing. Okay, so when I talked to Daniel Lanois yesterday, we talked about being able to punch, and you have to be have good rhythm to do that. That was kind of a thing about being engineering on tape, yep. and you could really screw things up oh, yeah, if you man. screwed up a punch. Yeah, I think part of that came from me being a drummer, knowing like microseconds where a beat was going to be. It depended on the tape machine also, because there was a certain sort of ramp between the erase head and the record head. Some machines were very forgiving, some were not. Yeah. Um, when we're doing Wasting Light, you know, that was all done on tape. All done on tape, And yeah. uh, James Brown, the engineer, said, but you punch in. He, he wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, do, do, do. And Taylor was great, because he'd play the same part exactly the same, but maybe he wanted to play a different fill. So do, yep. do, 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 and back out. Yeah. And I just, I just knew intuitively where I could get in and out, and, and you wouldn't hear the, hear the punch. So note, if, it's great to have songs that go do, 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 <laughs> with these big holes that go do, 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 punch, do, 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 punch out, you know, that, those are easy, but when you're playing eighth notes all the way through the song, it's, you got, it's a lot more tricky. Now, would you uh, do any tape editing on the drums on that, on that record? I think I tape edited one song. Mixing uh, sections or something set, like well, that? Well, just takes, it might have been in Bloom that I took Whatever the take they did, I think maybe there was one I thought the ending was better, so I just maybe the outro, like the last course outro I took from take three, and you know, we maybe kept take two, but take three was the outro.